Now, it's a matter of the greatest importance to all of us meeting here this afternoon as to whether the things of which we are reading are actually true. Because the resurrection of Jesus is either the supreme fact of history or it's the greatest and cruelest hoax this world has ever known. And so it's of vital importance that we know just where we stand on this issue because the resurrection of Jesus is the foundation of the Christian hope, the foundation of the Christian faith. And if it's not true, then our faith is vain and there's no hope at all. <clears throat> and so we ask the question, is the story of the resurrection given to us in the Gospels a true story, a true history of facts? Or is it all a fairy story, the product of imagination? Or something worse, a deliberately false story, a tissue of lies intended to deceive? Are the Gospel writers telling us the literal truth when they say that the angel of the Lord descended from heaven and rolled away the stone? Did the angel really release Jesus from the tomb on the third day? Did Jesus, after his supposed resurrection, appear to Mary Magdalene and to the other women who visited the tomb? Did he afterwards appear to his disciples? Was he really with them for 40 days after his alleged resurrection? Or is it all the product of imagination? You see, some would have us believe that it was all wishful thinking on the part of the disciples and the women. That these people were merely the victims of hallucinations. Now, the dictionary definition of an hallucination is seeing something else and mistaking it for the thing you are looking for. Seeing something else and mistaking it for the thing you are looking for. But you see, these people weren't looking for Jesus. To them, he was dead and gone, and they never expected to see him again. Not in this life. They certainly weren't looking for him. Then again, if they had been merely the victims of hallucinations, then we would have had Mary seeing the gardener and imagining him to be Jesus. But instead of that, we have Mary seeing Jesus and thinking him to be the gardener. We would have had the two on the road to Emmaus, meeting a stranger and imagining him to be Jesus. But instead of that, we have them meeting Jesus and thinking him to be a stranger. No, the, the, these people weren't expecting to see Jesus, and so they certainly didn't conjure him up in their imaginations. The resurrection appearances weren't hallucinations. They weren't the result of wishful thinking on the part of the disciples. All this wasn't just purely the result, the product of their imaginations. If you say it was, then you have to admit that there were never such imaginative people as these. Not only did they imagine that they all, not only did they imagine the same thing, but they all happened to imagine the same thing at the same time. Not only did Mary Magdalene think she'd seen the risen Jesus, but the other women thought they'd seen him as well. All the apostles thought they'd seen him. And not only did these people think that they'd seen him, but they also thought that they had touched him, held him, spoken with him, and even eaten with him, not just once, but many times over a period of 40 days. Wonderful imaginations they all had. But that's not all. It sounds amazing, but on one occasion, a gathering of over 500 people imagined that the Lord Jesus appeared to them. Isn't that amazing that all these people could be affected by the same delusion? Can we really imagine that? Can we really imagine that they could all be affected by the same delusion? Well, of course not. Well then, if the disciples weren't deluded, then perhaps they were lying. Would they lie? Would they deceive? After all, people don't deceive without a motive. What motive had the disciples for making up a story such as this? Their proclamation of the resurrection of Jesus didn't bring them power or honour or wealth 
or anything like that. No, it brought them hardship and suffering. It brought them persecution and it brought them the most terrible of deaths. And yet still they stuck to their story. They were willing to die for their belief. They were willing to die for their belief. Oh, but then the sceptic comes along and says, Oh, but we know that many people have been willing to die for what they have wrongly believed to be true. Well, yes, we admit that. Today we have Islamic extremists, suicide bombers, who are willing to die because they wrongly believe that such action will gain them an immediate place in paradise. Yes, we admit that people have been willing to die for something which they have wrongly believed to be true. But the point, you see, is this. No one is ever willing to die for something which they know to be wrong. That's the point, isn't it? No one is ever willing to die for something which they know to be untrue. Now, don't you think that if their story had been untrue, then somebody eventually would have given the show away. Most of the apostles died a martyr's death. Now, in order to escape that, don't you think that eventually someone would have admitted, all right, it isn't true, we made it all up. But nothing like this happened. Nothing like this happened because their story was true. These men wouldn't lie. These were men of outstanding character. Can we really imagine that these men who had been in the company of Jesus and had been influenced by his teaching, can we really believe that they all got together and concocted the most wicked and cruel, cruelest hoax ever foisted upon the minds of men and women? But let's suppose for a moment either that their story was untrue or that they were deliberately lying. In either case, it would have been the simplest thing in the world to disprove their story. All the Roman or the Jewish authorities had to do was to go to that tomb and produce the body of Jesus, and that would have silenced the disciples forever. But the Roman and Jewish authorities didn't do this. They didn't do it because they couldn't do it. They couldn't produce the body of Jesus because the body of Jesus was no longer in that tomb. The tomb was empty. Now this fact was accepted by all those involved, both friend and foe alike. It was common ground between them. It was the one fact that was never in dispute. The tomb was empty. How? How did the tomb come to be empty? What had happened to the body of Jesus? Well, the gospel explanation is that Jesus had risen from the dead, that the angel of, that the angel of God had descended from heaven, rolled back the stone and released him from the tomb. And we believe that this is the only explanation that will stand up to inquiry. And yet, there have always been those who have denied the fact or the possibility of that resurrection. There are even those today, religious ministers amongst them, who deny that the resurrection ever took place. And uh, you may remember how some years ago, one church leader, a bishop, caused a storm by describing the resurrection as a kind of conjuring trick with bones. And when questioned about the empty tomb, he said that, he could no more explain how the tomb came to be empty than he could explain how Santa Claus came down the chimney at Christmas time. But you see, the point is, there never was a Santa Claus, and so he never came down any chimney. But there was a Jesus, and he was buried in a tomb. And yet, on the third day, that tomb was empty. Why? How? What had happened to the body of Jesus? Well, all sorts of theories have been invented to account for the empty tomb and the missing body, and we'll have a look at some of them now. Uh, it's been suggested, for instance, that uh, grave robbers had perhaps stolen the body. But why would grave robbers go to the trouble 
of unwrapping the body and leaving the grave clothes behind. Doesn't make sense, does it? It's been suggested, perhaps, that Joseph of Arimathea had perhaps removed the body to another tomb. But if Joseph had done so, wouldn't he have said so? Of course he would. No, we can't accept this theory. Neither can we accept the theory that either the Roman or the Jewish authorities had removed the body. If they had done so, wouldn't they have said so? Of course they would. They would have issued a statement explaining the true facts of the case, and that would have silenced the disciples forever. No, we can't accept this theory. Another theory that's been put forward is that in the early light of the morning, the women who went to anoint the body of Jesus mistakenly went to the wrong tomb. And so you have Dr. Kersop Lake writing some years ago and having the women coming and finding an empty tomb with the gardener or someone standing around. And at that point, he deviates ever so slightly from the Bible record. And whereas Matthew and Mark read, Ye seek Jesus of Nazareth, which was crucified. He is not here. He is risen. Come, see the place where they laid him. He cuts out the words, He is risen. And as the record read, Ye seek Jesus of Nazareth, which was crucified. He is not here. Come, see the place where they laid him. In other words, you've come to the wrong tomb, lady. ladies. Come, let me show you the right one. But... The women were too silly or too frightened to listen and they ran off saying that they'd seen an angel or somebody who told them that Jesus was no longer in his tomb. And from that, they later developed the theory that he had risen from the dead. But you see, if the women went to the wrong tomb, then Peter and John also later went to the wrong tomb. And if these people did go to the wrong tomb, then surely Joseph of Arimathea would later have told them of their mistake. Not only that, but the Jewish authorities themselves would have been able to point out which was the right tomb. The Jewish authorities knew which was the right tomb because they themselves had posted a guard there. And so we come to the next theory. And the next theory is, well, the best one yet, is <laughs> that Jesus didn't in fact die on the cross, but only swooned. Later, the coolness of the tomb and the aromatic spices by which he was surrounded revived him, and he was able to escape from the tomb and convince his disciples that he had risen from the dead. Now, let's just think for a moment what had happened to Jesus. All four Gospel writers agree that the arrest of Jesus took place late at night and that the Jewish trial which followed was carried on for the remainder of that night before sending Jesus the following morning to Pontius Pilate. Now, I put it to you that after a night like that, then Jesus would be exhausted. But it didn't end there, did it? Because after an initial examination, Pilate sent him to Herod. And then after he'd been returned to Pilate, the examination continued. And then at the end, perhaps because he thought that this would be enough to satisfy the Jews, we're told that Pilate had Jesus scourged. Now, behind those words is an appalling amount of cruelty and pain because the scourge, you see, consisted of leather thongs containing metal balls, pieces of bone, pieces of lead and so on, which tore out the flesh. The point of scourging was to bring the prisoner close to collapse or death. In fact, some prisoners actually died under scourging. scourging. Now, I haven't seen it, but I understand that Mel Gibson's film of some years ago, The Passion of the Christ, more or less accurately portrays the appalling cruelty involved. Now, medical experts tell us that 
because of loss of blood and so on, Jesus, after being scourged, would be suffering from what is known as hypovolemic shock. He would be literally shaking. And so there's no doubt that he was in a critical condition before he ever reached the place of crucifixion. And then, when he did reach the place of crucifixion, Jesus had spikes driven through his hands, or more accurately, his wrists and his feet. Spikes which would damage the sensitive nerves in those members. And then he was lifted up on the cross to suffer the most cruel and barbaric form of execution ever devised by man. Now, I don't want to go into details regarding the pain and agony of death by crucifixion, but a new word had to be invented to describe it, and that's the word excruciating. Excruciating, which literally means out of the cross. Well, now we come to the final episode of this uh, sad little story. Because all this occurred at the time of Passover, The Jewish authorities, we find, asked Pilate to have the prisoners' legs broken so that this might hasten their deaths. But we're told that when they came to Jesus, they found that he was dead already. But just to make sure, one of the soldiers took a spear and thrust it into his side. And the apostle tells us that there came out straight away blood and water. Now, this was no amateur yielding that spear. This was a professional soldier trained in warfare. He would certainly know how to use a spear. Now, I understand that if you're going to stab somebody, you don't strike downwards because all that does is, all that would do would be to rattle off the ribcage. No, you strike upwards under the ribcage and into the vital organs. And that's what the soldier would do. And so he would thrust his spear upwards because Jesus was lifted up on the cross, wasn't he? And his spear would go in and up under the vital or under the ribcage and into the vital organs. Now, can you imagine anybody surviving that? Seems out of the question, doesn't it? Roman executioners did know their job after all. But let's just imagine for a moment that Jesus did somehow manage to survive all that he'd gone through. A stone cold tomb is hardly an intensive care unit, is it? And yet we're asked to believe that Jesus did in fact come round on the third day. Despite having been without food or water uh, for three days and without medical attention. But even against all the odds this did happen, he'd still to effect his escape from the tomb. First of all he had to rid himself of the heavy spice laden grave clothes And then there was the matter of that great stone which had been rolled to the door of the tomb. Now it must have been a tomb, a stone of some size, because uh, you remember that the women who later went to visit the tomb were, uh, they were wondering how they were going to move it. Now that stone would be a round stone like a millstone and it would fit into a groove. Now, if you had the necessary manpower, then from outside you could get hold of the edge of the stone and roll it. But from inside, there was nothing to get hold of. And you couldn't just push it forward, even if you had the necessary strength. And yet, in spite of all that, we're asked to believe that Jesus did somehow manage to escape. And then, having somehow got past the guards, managed to limp and crawl, naked presumably, and on lacerated feet to the place where his disciples were hiding. Then you have to imagine those stupid men becoming convinced that he'd been raised from the dead 
and then going out to preach a risen Lord who had conquered death and the grave and who by his glorious resurrection had become the prince of life, the first fruits of the dead and the first one of a great harvest to follow. I ask you, can we really believe this theory? Well, I don't know about you, but I find it much easier to believe in the resurrection itself. Well, you could go on, and uh, the theories become more and more complex, more and more fantastic. You have a Jewish writer, Hugh Sconfield, writing a book called The Passover Plot, in which he devises the theory that it was a kind of conspiracy between the Lord Jesus and Joseph of Arimathea for Jesus to get very near to the point of death by being drugged and then stage manage a resurrection. But the plot went wrong because the Roman soldier thrust a spear into his side and he did actually die. But then Joseph's assistant was later mistaken by, by an emotionally crazed Mary for Jesus and that's how the fable of his resurrection came about. But it doesn't really matter because all these theories fall down sooner or later on account of their own improbability. And so that leaves us with just one other, the oldest theory, the first story ever invented to account for the empty tomb and the missing body, the claim that the disciples had come by night and stolen the body. Now, this must be the most ridiculous story ever invented. Why? Well, because the Jewish authorities had taken every precaution to prevent such a thing happening. Let's turn to that chapter which we read together. Matthew chapter 27. Matthew chapter 27 and verse 62. Now the next day that followed the day of the preparation, the chief priests and Pharisees came together unto Pilate, saying, Sir, we remember that that deceiver said whilst he was yet alive, After three days I will rise again. Command, therefore, that the sepulchre be made sure until the third day, lest his disciples come by night and steal him away, and say unto the people, He is risen from the dead. So the last error shall be worse than the first. Pilate said unto them, Ye have a watch. Go your way, make it as sure as ye can. So they went and made the sepulchre sure, sealing the stone and setting the watch. Now, it doesn't really matter whether this was a Roman or a Jewish watch, a Roman or a Jewish god. It was their duty to guard that tomb, to see that the stone wasn't interfered with and that the body lying inside wasn't disturbed and yet in spite of all this we find that on the third day the tomb was empty the sealing of the stone the setting of the watch had proved in vain these obstacles had been overcome how how had they been overcome Matthew tells us chapter 28 and verse 2 behold there was a great earthquake for the angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled back the stone from the door and sat upon it. His countenance was like lightning and his raiment white as snow. And for fear of him, the keepers did shake and became as dead men. I'll bet they did. I'll bet they did. And so it was that Jesus was delivered from the power of death forever. How did the God recovered? Matthew tells us in chapter 28 and verse 11 that some of the God came into the city and told the chief priest what had happened. And then in verse 12, we're told, verse 12, And when they were assembled with the elders and had taken counsel, they gave money unto the soldiers, saying, Say ye his disciples came by night and stole him away while we slept. 
and if this come to the governor's ears, we will persuade him and secure you. So they took the money and did as they were taught. Now, this must be the lamest explanation for the fact of the empty tomb that it's possible to think of. The claim that the disciples came and stole the body while the gods slept. Just remember how the disciples acted around this time. They were afraid in case they should suffer a similar fate to Jesus. At the time of his capture, they all forsook him and fled. When one of them, Peter, was accused of being his disciple, he was so terrified that he denied three times that he had anything whatever to do with the man. The events which followed filled the disciples with great fear. We're told that they met behind closed doors. They met behind closed doors for fear of the Jews. Can we really imagine then that these few terrified men would dare come out of their hiding place and steal to the sepulchre at night? Can we really believe that they made their way to the sepulchre, somehow got past the guard, rolled away the stone, took away the body, did all this without being observed, and then presumably hid the body somewhere where no one would ever find it? Does this explain why they suddenly became terribly brave, lost all fear of the Roman and Jewish authorities, and began boldly to announce the fact that Jesus had risen from the dead and that they had seen him? And remember that they stuck to this story despite all the opposition and persecution which came upon them as a result. It's too incredible, isn't it? I mean, after all, what good was the body of Jesus to those disciples, even if they had stolen it? Remember, they weren't expecting him to rise from the dead. They didn't understand the Jewish scriptures, which predicted that he would rise from the dead. And when Jesus himself had spoken of his coming resurrection, they hadn't understood him. Why then should the disciples decide to steal the body and announce to the world that he had risen? Now then, did those disciples later act like grave robbers, like men who had committed a crime? No, we find them suddenly, amazingly, as we've said, losing all fear and proclaiming that Jesus had risen from the dead and that they had seen him. Well, their preaching, their preaching, we find, turned the world upside down. Thousands were converted by their preaching. Thousands came to accept the truth of their word. Why? Because it was so clear and convincing. It wasn't a case of we believe that Jesus rose from the dead because somebody told us so or somebody persuaded us so. No, even when they were told so, they didn't believe it. They didn't believe Mary Magdalene. They didn't believe the other women. One of them, Thomas, didn't believe until he'd actually put his finger into the nail mark and this hand into the side of the risen Jesus. No, it wasn't a case of we believe that Jesus rose from the dead because someone told us so or persuaded us so. It was a case of we know that he rose from the dead because we saw him after he had risen. Time and time again, we read words like these. This Jesus hath God raised up, whereof we are witnesses. Again, him God raised from the dead, whereof we are witnesses. Again, the Lord of the God of our fathers raised up Jesus, and we are his witnesses of these things. We are witnesses of all things which he did. Him God raised up the third day and showed him openly, not to all the people, but unto witnesses chosen before of God, even unto us who did eat and drink with him after he rose from the dead. No, the apostles didn't put forward the claim that Jesus had risen from the dead on the grounds of hearsay. It was on the grounds of there being actual eyewitnesses to the resurrection. Not only had they seen the risen Jesus, but they'd also touched him, held him, spoken with him, and even eaten with him. 
not just once, but many times over a period of 40 days. There could be no mistake here. He appeared to them either individually or when they were together. He appeared to the women. He appeared to the two on the road to Emmaus. He appeared to Peter. He appeared to James. He appeared to ten disciples in the absence of Thomas. He appeared to them again later when Thomas was with them. On one occasion, he appeared, as we have said, to a gathering of over 500 people. And when the Apostle Paul, some years later, wrote his first epistle to the Corinthians, most of those people were still alive and could be questioned. Yes, the evidence for the truth of the resurrection was overwhelming and thousands came to accept the truth of the apostles' words. And the Roman and the Jewish authorities were powerless, powerless to stem the tide which began to flow from the apostles' witness to the resurrection. But, you know, the claims and proofs put forward by the apostles 2,000 years ago are just as convincing today as they were then. And that's not uh, just my opinion, it's also the opinion of one of the world's leading lawyers. I've forgotten his name. <laughs> Sir Arthur Clarke. Sir Arthur Clarke, a uh, one time King's counsellor, who wrote As a lawyer, I have made a prolonged study of the evidence for the events of the first Easter day. To me, the evidence is conclusive. And over again, over and over again in the High Court, I have secured the verdict on evidence not nearly so compelling. I say unequivocally that the gospel evidence for the resurrection of Jesus Christ is so overwhelming that as a lawyer I accept it unreservedly as the testimony of truthful men to facts that they were able to substantiate. Sir Arthur Clark, one time King's Council. Well, this afternoon we've had a look at just some of the proofs, some of the evidence that there is for the truth of the resurrection. And to me, the evidence is overwhelming and convincing. But to any who still doubt, then we say, look into the matter for yourselves. Come to the scriptures with an open mind. Go through the Gospels and the Acts of the Apostles and Paul's first epistle to the Corinthians, which we haven't had time to look at. But go through the Gospels, the Acts of the Apostles, Paul's the 15th chapter of his epistle to the Corinthians. Consider the arguments. Consider the arguments. Weigh the evidence. And by the time you've done all that, we feel that all your doubts will vanish. All the doubts will vanish and all the hostile theories will be forgotten in the face of the undeniable fact, the undeniable and glorious fact, the undeniable and glorious truth of the fact that Jesus Christ really did rise from the dead. And now, just to finish, I'd like to bring to your notice just one more line of evidence. Again, it's evidence that convinces me and it's evidence that's there all around us for those who have eyes to see. What do I mean? Well, it's like this. You ask me how I know he lives, the Lord who bled and died, or how I know God raised to life the one men crucified. And there are so many reasons to believe his holy being. The proofs are all around us for those with eyes for seeing. The leaves that fell at autumn and were covered in the sod, now budding on the tree boughs, lifting their arms to God. The flowers that were buried and entombed beneath the snow, now pushing through the darkness to bid the spring hello. On every side doth nature retell the Easter story. So who are we to question the resurrection glory? Thank you.